here is that look this is a seven minute talk now this is not meant to be a exhaustive review of the literature on LASIK versus PRK. Uh, instead, it's really going to be about my own personal preferences, my personal biases, my, and my personal uh, experiences. Uh, and I would say as a surgeon, I, I tend to, I am a fairly progressive guy. I embrace new technology, uh, new techniques. But when it comes to refractive surgery, and I've done LASIK and LASIK and EpiLASIK, all of them, I still prefer PRK, and I'm going to tell you why in this talk. So this is a very busy slide, and it would take seven minutes to go through all of this, and we're not going to go over all of it. Uh, but traditionally, and this is sort of the traditional views of LASIK and PRK, <clears throat> and I would say that some of this needs to change, but traditionally we think of LASIK as a very wow factor surgery. It's very quick, very fast, very painless. Uh, people don't miss a lot of work, and they're very happy immediately after the surgery. Of course, the classical disadvantages are flap, flap-related complications, which can be severe, uh, and of course, the risk of ectasia. Uh, PRK, just the opposite. Um, it, the big advantages of PRK has always been no flaps, therefore no flap complications, and yes, it is a cheaper, easier surgery to do. The disadvantages of PRK, and this is what's always stymied PRK as a procedure, is that there's this idea of a very slow visual recovery, a lot of significant pain for a long period of time, a lot of missed work, and a very high risk of haze and wound healing issues and maybe even infection. And what I'm going to show you is that that's not necessarily true anymore. Uh, so what about the visual outcomes between LASIK and PRK? Now, there have been two uh, Cochrane reviews done in the last year and a half, both of which are very good. They've looked at the world literature on both of these topics, myopic, LASIK versus PRK, and hyperopic. The first study, myopia, uh, looked at 13 different trials, uh, 2,000 eyes, and uh, nine of those trials were actually randomized. And this covered the entire recorded history of refractive surgery from the 80s to today. And basically what they said was LASIK gives, yes, faster visual recovery and is a less painful technique, but the two techniques appear to give similar outcomes at one year. For hyperopia, a Cochrane review was attempted. They wanted to look at all of the great randomized trials that have ever been done, and actually there was not a single one. So they ended up looking at the non-randomized trials and basically came to the conclusion that hyperopic PRK and hyperopic LASIK have comparable uh, efficacy. When you look at the data for PRK versus LASIK and EpiLASIK and all the other surface ablation techniques, to my eyes, uh, there has not been a Cochrane review, but looking at all the papers, and it's apples and oranges in a lot of them, there's really no tremendous advantage to uh, keeping the epithelium or discarding it. <clears throat> but whatever surgery you choose, let's not forget, there's a 95% satisfaction rate with refractive surgery uh, worldwide. This is a short video of basically my PRK technique, and it's really nothing fancy. I start with a little mitomycin, I mean, I'm sorry, a little uh, tetracaine on a mirror cell sponge, apply it to the central cornea for about 30 seconds, and then I'll take that sponge and, and touch the conjunctiva and the uh, lid margin, which I do believe reduces intraoperative and postoperative discomfort. Then uh, a nine millimeter uh, alcohol well is applied to the cornea. You can use an eight millimeter well. I prefer nine millimeters for an eight millimeter ablation. And you want to be sure that this alcohol stays in that well and does not seep out underneath or drip over the side because alcohol does burn and cause worsening pain. After about 25 seconds, the alcohol is removed. And I like to, before lifting up that well, score the epithelium. And that provides a nice, well demarcated epithelial uh, nine millimeter ring. Then with a dry wax cell, uh, and I like to call this the sort of epithelial rexus because it's a very similar motion to what we do in cataract surgery where we create a capsule rexus. And as you can see here, after the tetracaine and after the alcohol, the epithelium really does come off quite easily and quite quickly. And uh, you can see that this epithelium is really coming off in a complete sheet. So theoretically, one could use this epithelium for LASIK, replacing it at the end of the surgery. But as I said, I don't find any real advantage to, to keeping the, the epithelium, so, the, so I discard it. <clears throat> and then, of course, once the epithelium is removed, you want to do that as quickly as possible. We have the Visex S4 in our center, uh, wayfront-guided treatments, iris-registered treatments, etc. You do the ablation, and then this is the mitomycin C, uh, which I would admit I use fairly liberally. Pretty much anybody over three and a half or four diopters will get it. I don't 
uh, soak the sponge. It's a very damp sponge. You don't want that mitomycin leaking onto the limbus for obvious reasons. And then it's irrigated off with cold BSS, two bottles, uh, vigorously. A little drop of steroid, Predforte in this case, uh, and it uh, gives a nice visualization of that epithelial ridge. I like to flatten all of that out before the contact lens goes on and remove any alcohol-soaked epithelium that might be hanging around. And then a bandage contact lens goes over the eye, uh, and I like this to be a fairly tight fit lens. Not too tight, but tight enough that it's not moving around, and I do think that reduces discomfort. So the post-op regimen, again, nothing particularly fancy. For the higher myopes, I'll use steroids longer. For lower myopes, I'll use it less, and maybe use a, a, a lighter steroid. Uh, my, I prefer fourth generation fluoroquinolone for about 10 days. However, if there's somebody's a healthcare worker or who has significant risk for MRSA, I will add polytrim to the mix. Uh, everybody gets restasis, cyclosporin, everybody gets vitamin C, everybody gets omega 3s. For pain control, again, nothing particularly fancy here. Ketorolac, four times a day, PRN for pain in the first few days. Oral over the counter NSAIDs, PRN for pain. Chilled artificial tears, chilled cold compresses helps a lot. But what I don't use are oral steroids, oral narcotics, uh, unless I, my arm gets twisted by the patient, anti-epileptics uh, I don't, definitely don't use, and the comfort drops like dilute, uh, proparacaine or tetracaine I never use. And so what are my results with that technique and that regimen? And what I just did for this talk was just looked at my first 10 cases of this year, uh, uh, bilateral cases, uh, with a follow-up of at least six months. <clears throat> Spherical equivalent was about four and a quarter in this group. And the mean uh, uncorrected visual acuity, now this is with, admittedly, with both eyes open, because I usually find that that's really what you want to know. What is the vision with both eyes open? Uh, and so immediately after the procedure, we talk about the wow factor with LASIK, but these patients on, on average are about 20, 23, and almost all of these patients have some wow moment immediately after the surgery. Oh my gosh, I can see the clock, whatever it may be. Post-op day one, the mean uncorrected acuity, 2020 with both eyes open, 90% were 2020 or better. By day four, that's when the epithelium is really coming in and, and meets in the center and there's an epitheliopathy, so the vision usually does drop by post-op day four, but it's really in the 2030 range and most patients are already back at work. By post-op month one, 2016, uh, OU acuity uh, uncorrected, and by post-op month six, with each eye individually, 100% of the patients were 2015. Pain. What is the pain? I ask all patients, zero to five, five being the worst pain of your life, zero being no pain. What is your pain on the first night and the first day after PRK? And the, rain, the, the mean on the first night is 1.2, mild pain overall. And on the, on the mean on post-op day one, uh, or 1.2 and 1.3 on the night before. 60% of patients on day one had scores of one or less. 40% had no pain, zero pain on day one. Uh, and nobody had any pain after the third day. Complications, and I looked at the last six years, because uh, this was easy to do because the, these are all zeros. There was no cases of epithelial healing, there were no cases of infection, no cases of haze, no, no enhancements, although I, do, I am doing my first enhancement in a couple weeks, uh, no refractory dry eye, no lasting night vision disturbances, no mitomycin or steroid complications, and no cases of ectasia. So in summary, modern PRK or advanced surface ablation, whatever you want to call it, I think is a very effective, very safe surgery. Of course, we're not creating flaps, so we eliminate all complications. Mitomycin has proven to be very safe uh, over the last 15, 20 years, and has virtually eliminated the risk of haze. And ectasia, of course, after PRK is extraordinarily rare. Long-term visual outcomes, as we saw with the Cochrane reviews, are comparable to LASIK. And in my little uh, cohort, short-term visual outcomes really are much closer to LASIK. Uh, there's significantly less pain than we traditionally associate with PRK. Uh, and it really only lasts for three days, and it's usually a mild uh, amount. It's easier, cheaper, quicker surgery to perform, and it is very high uh, patient satisfaction. And there are definitely the wow factors associated with PRK that we see with LASIK. And that's it. Thank you.